Welcome, Deborah. Um, this is Deborah Hatswell from BBR Investigations. Deborah has um, an incredible um, sort of YouTube channel and uh, and web pages, and she's also got a map um, detailing um, all of these sighting site locations in Ireland and across the world of sort of um, Sasquatch uh, and also sort of liminal kind of species covering the entire gambit you know sort of so welcome um deborah would you like to sort of just introduce yourself and sort of talk about sort of your thing and maybe talking about the the, the fabulous map the interactive map and welcome deborah oh, tell us about thank, yourself thank you for asking me on it's absolutely wonderful i took an incredible um sighting of four little men um i'm just going to pull the report up and it was a lady contacted me about 18 months ago and she'd found my work so it all started to, for me when I was in my cot I used to see things around my bed and around the cot and that never went away for me it never did so when I was a teenager I had an experience with something that you would call impossible um he looked like a caveman or a, an ape man of some kind and that set me on a journey of looking for other people who'd seen things that just weren't accepted in the UK and Ireland, where you'd say, well, you'd seen a UFO and people would scoff at you, or, you know, you had a paranormal experience, you would scoff at you. And I think that's even, even harder for people that see the fae or the little folk, because people tend to poo-poo that. It isn't important, but to me it is. That means that there's something special about that land. So if somebody's seeing some form of elemental or a fairy on that land, that tells me that I need to make a note of everything that comes in around it. And that's kind of how the map started. So it was back in the olden days, I used to have a big map on the wall and I'd find um, a sighting or a report from someone and I'd put a pin in it and I'd pop it down in my notes. And these days it's interactive, it's in Google. And I just put it out there free. Because lots of people, I believe, hundreds of us out there in the UK, have these stories either of our own or within our families and they've never been shared. So we don't know about them. And I think we're missing out on an awful lot of um, information, really. That we, We've got kind of half of the jigsaw and we've got half of the box and the picture. But out there in, in our families are all the other pieces that we could maybe put together and come up with a kind of explanation of my biggest question is, is it the land itself that attracts these, what, what, what word can we put on them to cover everything? I can't think. Um, entities I was thinking, is not... <laughs> I was calling them lim liminal species, actually, yeah. just, um, I yeah. think, because creatures just doesn't seem um, appropriately sort of, it just doesn't seem appropriate. But I think liminal species is, is I, I, that's where I'm sitting at this evening. So, um, well, I wanted to give you an example of it. So I, I've worked, so I've worked from 1982 and I've taken reports of what people would class as a Bigfoot creature or a Sasquatch um, or a dogman, which is a, something up on two legs that has a, like your typical werewolf really, but without a tail. Um, and that goes all the way through, right the way through UFOs, paranormal, goblins, um, little people, you'd be amazed. So this lady reached out to me and she was making a report for her aunt. Um, and she said, hi, Deborah, my auntie almost caused a car crash when she was 14. It was in 1969 and we lived in Bush Mills area of Northern Ireland. And she blamed the crash on four little men that were on the road. Her name was Una Don and she was driving and she was with her mother margaret don and they were on the country road in the early morning uma screamed look out and her mum veered and flipped the car and she was told off quite sternly and she was really upset about this and she said to her mum there was four little men on the road and you nearly hit them and she said they walked in single file and they had robes or blankets around their shoulders and she said this might sound like a tall tale but in all of her years, she told it, she always told it in the same way. And in her 20s, she became very religious. Um, and she was a John Wimber evangelist. And she said she married a member of the outreach. She was a really religious woman. She would, wouldn't lie. And she had some strict moral character. And she said she couldn't explain it. It was just what happened that day. And her mum didn't see a thing. 
She said, my Auntie Noon is 90, would be 90 now, and she's passed on. Um, and she just wanted to know if there was anything else that I knew or I could pull up about that area. And I said to her, you do know what Una means, don't you? And she said, no. And I said, it means Queen of the Fairies, um, her with the long golden hair. And she said that was really strange because they the farm that they lived on was called Fairy Farm. And I said, I think you're just connected to that land way back through the generations to a time when we accepted the little folk. They were, you know, something that we accepted. We didn't scoff about it. I said, and I think that's probably why you aren't seeing them because when we're younger, we haven't had as much society intervention. So we can still see beyond the veil when we're younger, especially teenage girls, because they come into the female energy at that time. And you're tapping into a, a, a new source of energy, you see. So it was just wonderful. But the, the example I wanted to give was, if she hadn't reached out to me, we would never have heard of those four little men or of Una and her sighting. So if there's anybody else out there who has an experience with absolutely anything, I would love to know about it so that I can put it onto the map and share it with people. And then maybe when someone like Una comes along, I'll have more, I'll be able to give some more information then. I could say, well, actually, this is what happened in the same area, you know, and that's something I try and do to my absolute most. But the only reports I have up there are large cats and dark shadow beings. So I don't think they're connected in any way. That's fascinating, Deborah. One of the things that, that strikes me whenever you talk about that is um, I had a, an interview there with Barry Fitzgerald um, and Barry, he was very right when he said that whenever it comes to the likes of sort of the fairy or the she, whatever, is um, or the people of the Sid Mounds, as he corrected, the um, is dates are important, like sort of whatever, what kind of the month. He had said that in County Meath that there was um, like the there would be like a hunt off with uh, with leprechauns at that time of the year. And he said that they're, they're not very nice people at all, <laughs> you know, so um, like you said. So but whenever you're talking about the little people, um, if you look at sort of the research of, um, again, another Ulster man, um, Michael Desarian, he he ref he references and shows us images of little people. They look kind of similar to our what we call leprechauns here in Ireland and yeah. uh, but over in in South America and basically sort of saying that there was an interplay between between sort of the two at that time, you know, even the likes of and surprised me greatly. But speaking was it uh, Gene Decode, um, he was talking about sort of, you know, the um, all of this, you know, what, what's happening sort of in the background at the moment. And um, one of the things that he'd said was that the little people, um, the little the little folk um, were, were helping out. Um, doing all of the the good work at the moment it was kind of really surprised me because um, I'd heard that there were some stories of people having seen you know the uh, leprechaun um, types uh, sort of in the the Kerry area but um, but I was yeah. just putting the whole thing together because it's just it's kind of new on me you know because um, yeah. You know, it I sort of I have a, a lot of people be associated with the likes of sort of the gentry or the tripping she that's also quite common is the likes of sort of the midnight hunt or the wild hunt and all of yeah. these different movements but these are all movements at sort of like cross times of the year like at sort of like spring equinox and sort of at sort of you know the, all of these kind of literally it's it's all to do with sort of seasonal whenever they move from place to place yeah. so it, you'd be surprised how that correlates even to bigfoot reports now the reason i tied started to learn that possibly these creatures that we're seeing that I saw may possibly not be flesh and blood. They may be of some dimension or other. And I wondered why it was really easy to find reports in England, Wales and Scotland. But I was struggling to find them in Ireland because I don't know the old language. And for all it's my family, I don't, I can't speak Gaelic. I can't speak Irish. So I was completely blocked off from all of that. I didn't know anything about it. And as I got older and I started to learn, I found some really historical reports of what the Irish would call the hairy man. They said he was covered in hair like a bear. They tell us he came from Ireland and he lived until a very great age in the woods. All parts of his body are grown with long black hair, which have stiffened and rubbed backwards, making him look very deliciously, it seems. And women find him very attractive. 
um, and it says that they would throw food and money into the woods in, in order really to kind of make him happy. Um, and it was called, they called him the man of monstrous birth. So what they were trying to say there is that he was quite handsome and he would seduce young ladies within the wood and they would have his children. Now, if you jump over to uh, Dorset in England, we have exactly the same kind of tale, exactly the same time in history. But there he's called a wood wolf and he was known to be very handsome and entice people, young ladies within the wood, and he would impregnate them. Now, if we go to Scotland, even as far back as the 6th century, we have the Satris, a man that's covered in hair, that's quite handsome, that lives in the woods, who will entice females in. So if we go back to a time where there was no global communication at all, and we've not heard of the word Bigfoot, and we haven't been told by society what things are, he would have been classed as the fae, as some kind, almost like Pam, some kind of elemental that lived in the wood that can procreate with female humans. You put that in 2023 and that's a Sasquatch that's in the United States of America. There is not a country in the world see, that doesn't have that kind of history. Every single country in the world has a history of a hairy caretaker that lived within the woods who would, on occasion, gave give female you know humans would give birth to children to him and even our very first stories the stories of albany the 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 lady who had three daughters i always get a name wrong um she was said to have come to england when we were back when we were called albion and her daughters mated with the giants of ireland wales and scotland and that's where this seed or I can't, I, there isn't a word that's right for it because Bigfoot just is not at all. That's an American thing that happened in the 50s. This is something that's that's natural to our land, you know, and it's natural to us as, as whether we're English, Irish, Scottish or Welsh. We, we're all intertwined within this. And back in the day, we were intertwined with nature and nature has a pattern. It has a rhythm and a flow. And one of the things that I'm good at is noticing those patterns and Bigfoot reports also have seasonal similarities. So you won't hear anything in an area for nine months of the year. And suddenly the woods are filled with strange things that have been made, like rock stacks or these strange glyphs that are made, almost Blair Witch style that are hung up in the woods. Um, horses will have the, the manes plaited um, and have flowers and things within them. Um, and that seems to happen as we go into the autumn months, so around about this time of the year, and then it will go incredibly quiet until Beltane, so around spring, and then things will start to happen again. So there is a seasonal flow, and the moon cycles seem to play in as well. They seem to be very important, as they were to us when we first walked on this land. That's, it's interesting you sort of say there's, there's so much in that, um, Deborah. Um, I mean, there's so many different sort of conversations and tales and stories to share. But um, was it whenever you're talking about sort of um, the Sasquatch and sort of how he was sort of you know involved with the ladies and the connection with the um, uh, with with the fairy in Ireland? Um, we have uh, we have a character with well, one of the kings, um, which is known as he was called the Dagda, and he was the great king. He was the the most favored and most adored king he was um he was he was absolutely adored so he, he he was a fairy you know so um but you're describing him like to the t but he was um man for the ladies you know so and uh, but sort of all of his tales are all very funny and sort of you know he's very um his life revolved about being good but but also um the ladies and food you know <laughs> you know so um but uh, in terms of sort of looks you're almost describing him too you know so because he was um he was he's always depicted as being sort of quite hairy you know so um i was looking at your maps and you have um was it Sasquatch over in sort of in uh, North County Antrim? And you have yeah. another Sasquatch. There's a newspaper article about it um, and uh, a local girl and, uh, and and her photograph of the Sasquatch. And also there was another article which was only a few miles away. Well, maybe 15, yeah. or 20 miles away um, in the Sperrins where 
Sasquatch was seen being escorted down the hills by the army. And I'm saying that sounds fairly terrifying. So um, so what, what about these stories here? Bearing in mind, we also have other kinds of liminal species kind of known in some of those areas. Um, it's just that that's the thing. And that's I've only been able to, to just the teeniest tip of the iceberg is the information that I have. Because I haven't been able to interact before, I don't have any investigators out there in Ireland, so nobody else is looking for these stories for me. I know, because it is such a magical place, that the map of Ireland should be absolutely full of these encounters, as it is in the UK. And that's always been the problem. I can't back, look back into any ancient text because I can't read it. And I can do that quite easily in, in the other areas of the UK. But in Ireland, I've always hit a kind of a brick wall. Um, unless I've been able to speak to some older people than the older generation. And they have no difficulty whatsoever talking about these things. It was just accepted for them. They would leave milk and honey out, in all honesty, so that, you know, they wouldn't come and steal the halves, blankets and things like that. Grannies in families would speak about them. And it just seems to be that we kind of get to, in our education, we kind of get to when the Romans come and everything gets wiped out. So anything before that is kind of just seen as, as um, like myth or legend. And it wasn't myth or legend, it was truth. But it was just skewed by putting religion over the top of religion over the top of religion. We didn't know about Roman gods when we first walked here. We had our own gods and they were the elements, you know, they, they were the first gods we had. And we worshipped them because they would get life or death to us. And I be honestly believe that every person living now still has that within them. And some people can tap into that. So they'd say, well, how, you know, how could somebody walk into a woodland in 2023 and see this mythical creature? Because there might be something about that person. They might be a catalyst in some way. And as they walk into that area, like anything that's out there, once you recognise it, once you see it, it begins to grow. It becomes more real almost. So as we accept something, it happens more and more. So you get a lot of people say, well, you know, no, there's not many people out there that have, have had these kind of... There are. I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of people. The last person I spoke to was on the 8th of September, and that was an 88-year-old gentleman in a farm in Bedfordshire, a very isolated farm, incredibly hit ill. He's had to be brought downstairs. But I didn't know any of this going in. I got a phone call from his carer who said to me, Deborah, I work with this chap, I live with him, and in the middle of the night he's seen something at the window and he is absolutely terrified. We've had to get the doctor down and we can't calm him down. See, I was actually in hospital at the time and I said to him, I get, I'm on the ward, but if you give me five minutes, I'll sneak out to my car. And that's what I did. I put my coat on and I sneaked down to the car and I phoned this older gentleman. And I said to him, don't tell me anything. I need to ask you some questions first. So I said to him, first question, are you of Irish descent? And he said, yes, my, both my mum and my dad were, were Irish and they came over here in the teens. Right. What's on the property that's incredibly negative? There's an old priory next door that was taken over by um, some Satanists many years ago. And negative stuff's always happened there. So I said, right, what's changed in the house? And he said, we brought my bed down that day. Normally I sleep upstairs. And this time, this for the first night I was downstairs and the cleaning lady had cleaned the curtains and she hadn't put them back up. And I thought, right. So I said to him, don't take this the wrong way when I tell you what he's called, but he's called the Death Wolf. I said, but Aerotech is an Irish, he's a wolf in all honesty, he's a wolf man. And he comes at times of sickness and death, not in a bad way, to walk you home, to guard you at that most critical part of your life. That is the weakest part of your life. And some people have bad acts early on and they worry that that's going to affect the way that they pass over. Um, and I said to him, it's all mixed in with that, Fred. Have you been thinking about passing? Are you frightened? And he said, yeah, he was frightened. And I said, this is all quite normal. And then I asked him to describe what he saw to me. And he said he saw what he saw looked like a, a man's body with a wolf's head. It had dog's teeth. It, it wasn't terrifying to look at, but it obviously it was very frightening 
the experience as a whole was incredibly frightening. He's seen something for the first time. He's not psychic, he's not a medium, he has no experience with any of this. But sometimes when we put our thoughts out there, the universe answers. And I think he's called it in. And I said to him, it's really worried about the property that's next door to you. And I think it's walking a boundary around your house just to keep you safe in a way. Um, and that calmed him down greatly because instantly when you think of anything with a wolf head, you go to werewolf, don't you? You go to frightening, terrifying things. But he wasn't. He was he was called the wolf god or man of the soil. That was another name for him. And he came, well, as I say, in times of great weakness when you needed him, when you needed him for strength. So fortunately, over two or three nights, Fred settled into a, a pattern now and he's, in, he's much, much better and he's very poorer. You know, he's very, very poorly. And I think that's why. I think it was a combination of him putting his thoughts out there and being worried. When I pass over, do I have to pay for these deeds, you know? And I said to him, if you're truly sorry and, you you know, you've done everything you can to kind of change your karma going forward, you've not got anything to worry about, you know? It's just, it's understandable. I mean, you look at your window now and you see something eight foot tall looking through at you with a wolf's head, you're going to be terrified, aren't you? You know? Yeah, well, I mean, you sort of what you remind me of stories that I that I hear quite a bit is um, of maybe somebody passing. I suppose so we were talking about the banshee, but more so yeah. that if there is um, if there is a, the likes of a death, um, then mm. literally the ancestors come back, you know, yeah. sort of, and they they come back to guide the soul, and and it can be it can be very emotional for people. I mean, I hear about people sort of their smoke alarms go off you know without for no reason all the lights start flicking around the houses even yeah. though even doors start banging all kinds of stuff all phenomena sort of um go happening whenever people are in that kind of position you know sort of kind of time whenever people realize that actually there's a lot more there's a lot more yeah. gone on you know so um and it is it is a bit of a wake-up call it, i mean the way you describe it there make it sound it makes it sound very reassuring <laughs> you know so and uh, you know and you tell it you tell it in a lovely way i've always kind of known it i don't don't know how i know these things but i've always kind of known that to, to trust it that that instinct that you know that that feeling that you have and I, I believe that when, we, when we're putting our thoughts out there, I think that when we're born, I think we have all of the abilities that come with being humans. We don't just have six senses. We have senses that kept us alive back in the day. If you only want to look at it from a physical shape, you stop you getting killed by bears. We as humans don't realise how powerful we are and what an energy we are. We are walking batteries. And some of us are affected by energy. So you'll find some people are very empathic so you know you know straight away whether you like someone or not or you'll take on their illness or their limp or even their accent you'd be amazed what natural things humans do that seem magical and we are magical beings and as we get into school and we go through in the ancient days a female came into her power from probably at the age of about 11 to 13 um, and they would carve an s on a belly and if i ever get a poltergeist case i asked him instantly is there a teenage girl in the house and nine times out of ten there is because her, her energy is changing so you'll get light bulbs that will flash above her head um i remember being really angry with my husband and i couldn't walk i was in a wheelchair and i was so angry with him something stamped across the kitchen that's what i wanted to do in my mind i wanted to stamp across the kitchen and shout at him and that something did it and i don't know whether i did that or something did it for me we're just very powerful beings. So as we get to the end of our lives, I think we drop a lot of our blinkers. I think a lot of society, you suddenly realise as you get older that I fit my skin now for the first time ever. Never growing up did, did I ever. I, I remember my first friend asking her what she did about the things in her bedroom at night. And she looked at me like I had two heads. And I never really had a best friend ever again. I was only about five or six then. But I realised that, you don't talk about it because if you talk about it, people look at you like you're a witch, you know. My grandmother was incredibly ashamed, ashamed of her gifts, and so is my mum, because that was their generation, you know. But back in the day, they would have been seen as wise women. We would have, like the hag, as an example, the hag. Anybody, they use that word in a bad way, but it actually means she who wears the crown. Because when you reach the age of the hag, 
you are no longer bound by society. You know, you become into yourself as a woman. I'm a grandmother. I'm 56 and I'm incredibly powerful. And I've done more with my life in the last 15 years than I ever did. You know, just because I've I, I've come from a place of being ashamed of what I can do to seeing how many people I've had. I speak to people like Fred two or three times a day. So I have no money. I have no money whatsoever. But I'm very rich in other things. So I speak to people and see them come from an, an experience that's terrified them, watch them come through that and out the other side to the point where then they can start looking at it with another eye because fear is terrible for trapping you. It trapped me for 25 years. I don't know what I saw that day. I don't know what he was. But I do know that I think there's a connection to John Dee. And I think it's to do with the old... When you look back in text, when people describe fairies, they describe them in all shapes and forms, or even seven foot tall and hairy. And if you've got an, an incredibly powerful Irish man that's scribing and summoning these demons, that might be the reason that I walked into that thing that day. And then two years later, another woman saw it. And then people had seen it in the 50s, in the 60s. And the last sighting of it was in 2021 when they were pulling the, the area apart. And I think it's disturbed the ground again. And he's come back. So people tell me what he is. But I don't know what he is because I didn't sit down and have a conversation. I was terrified seeing him, you know. Now you'd say he was the, do you remember the green man who hides his face in the leaves? I sat down with my friend and I was playing and we were laughing and talking. I was 15 and I seen a movement in the, the, the shrubbery and I locked eyes with something. And I don't know what it was to this day, but it looked like a man and an ape pushed together. And he just looked at me and I, I was up, I pushed my friend and I ran. I was crying, you know, I walked in the house and all I got done, I got told off for my uniform being in the state and that was it. That was all the counselling I got. And that was at my school. I had to go back there the next day for another 12 months till we finished. I was absolutely terrified that I was going to see him again. So by the time, like 20 or 30, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even go camping anymore. I, I fished every river in England and Ireland when we, we lived there for a while. And spent my entire growing up life on horses or out in the countryside or in the woodlands or fishing and from 15 I couldn't do that till I was 35 and that, that was what the fear did to me so locking yeah. yourself away and you try to explain that to a doctor or you know why can't you go on holiday because I can't what if I see that thing again they think you're absolutely crackers you know but back in the day I think I think that I think we've all got our own discussions about doctors yeah. at the moment. But sort of that you thought that maybe there could be a crossover with with the Green Man because I mean yeah. that kind of makes an awful lot of sense. But you also mentioned the name John D there. What what was yeah. you talking about with regards to John D and this whole situation? Because I made a bit of a um I made a bit of a supposition with regards to John D and and mm. sort of the ferry over here in in Ireland. I mean, what what are your thoughts about um John D and and his connection, or what what did he do with the ferry? Do you, you sometimes in life people have serendipities, don't they? And John D is John D is always popped up for me. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn the phone off. People are messaging me. John D has always popped up for me throughout my life. And where I lived in, in England was one of the places that when um, he was exiled to Manchester um, and she, she sent him, the, the Queen Elizabeth I and John Dee pop up in my, I don't know, they're just serendipitous, they've always been there in my life. But I never really looked into it until I was like in my 30s. And I, I discovered a lady contacted me. She was an author. And she said to me, Deborah, you know where you saw that thing? There is actually a society based. It was an old mansion house. So it was on um, like Parklands. But before that, in the 1500s, it was a plague field and nobody wanted it. Um, and John Dee was exiled up here. And Edward Keller and him were said to have stayed at the first original mansion that was on that site. And while they were there, they scribed, Edward Kelly scribed for a tall, hairy demon to come through because they wanted the power. They wanted to harness its power. So 
I'm trying to think of the lady's name, Claire Namid. Now she's an author and she writes books on angels. And I didn't know she contacted me because she'd heard me speaking about what had happened and where it had happened. And she said to me, you do know, don't you, that that was one of the areas where John D. scried? And I said, no, I didn't know that at all. And she said, yeah, they were trying to open up a portal at that at that point. Now, back, you think of all these years later, it's 1982. But outside that house, it had some really strange stones. It had four of them. One was limestone. One was granite, I think. One I couldn't name and tell you, just an ordinary boulder of some kind. And the other one was obsidian, a huge piece of obsidian that was bigger than me. And I used to sit on it when I was a kid. We all did. It, we used to play there for hours on end. It's my favourite place to be. Right, so jump forward 30 years. There's a place probably 10 miles from me where I live now, from where I had my sighting report. And that also has a cluster of these strange what we would call Bigfoot these days, these hairy looking creatures that people see. And when I look into the area, I find out it's where John Dee's wife stayed. When he was um, exiled up here, he went to Cheatham School and she had her own house on Alcombe Moor. And there are also around that home, there are these sightings. And I've always wondered if John Dee and me, some way, are tied in some way. And I've just tuned into that when I've been there. Or, I don't know. I don't have an explanation. I've tried my entire life to try and work out why it happened to me. Because I've run from it. I didn't want it. I didn't want any of this. I didn't want the gift. It was to be ashamed. I did nothing with it. I just, I, I hated it. I'd be in bed at night and all the taps would turn on in the house. Or it'd feel like someone had got hold of my bed and shook it. And instead of just accepting it and learning how to control it and do good with it, I ran from it. So I was always supposed to do what I do now. I just didn't want the responsibility of it because I was an ordinary working class girl who was seeing things that people thought I was absolutely mental and they wanted to put me in a, a loon. And I knew I wasn't crazy, but I could I can see things and I don't know how. I can walk into an area and I can tell you everything about it. And I don't know how I can do that. I can work through the layers. So to me, it's like opening a book. I walk into an area and I, I get a book. So I, I, I start at A and I go through it. And then I can work out why it's happening in the house or why it's happening to people. And I've just always been able to do that. I had my DNA done and I think I might be related to Edward Kelly. So I'm three quarters, I'm more Irish than I am. I'm, I'm, I'm basically Irish, Welsh and English, but I'm only a tiny bit English on my, one of my grandmother's size. I'm, I'm basically Irish and I, I, I think I'm related to him in some way. And he was a scryer. And I've been able to automatically write since I was a tiny child. And I, 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 it was a game I used to play when I was little. I used to call it the face game. So if I was really bored, my mum my and dad worked three jobs. We were really bored, poor. We had nothing. My father worked three jobs. My mother worked three jobs. So did my grandmother. And my, my grandfather was um, a tinker, as you'd call him. He had a scrapyard. And I used to get the old mirrors out of the scrapyard and I'd put them in the corner and you sit and you stare into them for ages and your face changes. And then when your face changes, you have to guess everything about that person who your face is. That was a game that I played as a child. I'd, I'd say that wasn't a game. I'd say you've been prompted there somewhere along the lines, you know. So um, I would say whoever whoever sort of coming through is, is is helping you along, you know. So, so many questions I would love to really go into with regards to those, you know. So, I mean, that's that's huge. We were talking about the Sasquatch there, and I'm really interested in the people that were developing like sort of connections. I mean, looking at the different, um, was it um, sort of Sasquatch and all the rest of it that we saw sort of in the, in sort of the north of the country, the ones that were sort of that were gathered up. I mean, horrendously by the by the the army. Um, apparently, that was there was footage of somebody that they saw a Sasquatch being taken away by the army mm -hmm. through, during the the sparrings there. But what what is what kind of a relationship do people have with these um, with these creatures and uh, and what do they learn from them? Especially that the Sasquatch and the mermaids. I'm really interested in that. You know, so um, what do you think there? And also with regards to the the fairy as well. Mm. For me, I think that all beings are either ne some are negative and some are positive, and that's just how it is. And it's the same with the Sasquatch. Don't get me wrong. Some have maybe been treated appallingly. 
through centuries and what they view us humans as is they see us as bestial you know they watch us they watch so many awful things happen in woodlands let's be honest and they see what we do to the land and 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 it frightens them because for them if when we believe in them when we believe in the fae when we believe in mermaids when we believe in these things that energy grows it's like a light bulb it's like giving it energy plugging it into something better and then with that you get a really positive kind of relationship going on a backwards and forwards thing that's what it's always been like for me but if you see it in a negative way and you, you you're frightened and you see it like that all the time and that's really is what it becomes because what you feed it is what it becomes and it's the same with any being one thing i have found is they seem to have something to do with water so when you look at all of the reports that are in the uk there are cl clusters around each estuary of mainly like wild man sasquatch you know that kind of uh, little foe mermaids um water horses that kind of thing so they i think that they might be elemental to the water because they follow the rivers inland and when you look at the the coordination between ireland and the uk you have far less estuaries than we have we have over 50 and i think you only have about five but when you look that's where the sighting reports are and i realized very early on that that northeast corner that's where Loch is it Loch Neagh? I always get the name wrong. I think it's Loch Neagh. Let me pull it up. It's Loch Neagh. That is that we say it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that might be the reason why you've got. I'm just going to have a count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Sasquatch reports around that lock. Wow. And you see them kind of heading out in a route almost north and south, so down to Wicklow and up to the Sperrins. Now, the lad on the, who saw them on the Sperrings was a chap in his 50s, and he is used to mountaineering. He's climbed every mountain in Europe. So when he's up there and he's finding strange prints and he's finding trees that have been tipped upside down, that's something that's very important in Ireland. That's what some of the fairy kings would do. They would flip a tree. So the roots were at the top and the, the top of the tree was at the bottom. And that was normally done with a yew tree. And that was their way of showing the, the, the gateway to the realm. Now we, we see that with Sasquatch, these upturned trees. So I've got two photographs from Ireland where the tree's been upturned, both in the northeast, and no tire tracks, no sign of tool marks on the tree, nothing that could have happened within wind. These are huge <laughs> trees, both seen by hiking passes. So he said that when he saw that creature that day, he realised even from a far off distance that it was at least twice the size of a man. He said it was absolutely huge and you could see it powering as it walked away. Um, and he waited for it to crest, and it didn't, and that's when he saw the army follow in, and he was convinced that they'd gone in there to get it, because I believe that our government know about them. And um, just to just to add to that, was it I had a, a conversation with um, Miles Johnson? Of course, we were talking about Loch Ness as well. Um, interesting at the moment, Loch Ness they're trying to shut it down because of um, water quality issues. I mean, it's a huge lock, and yeah. um, and they're trying to they're saying, oh no no, you, you can't go near it now because of water quality issues. So um, and uh, but there's been a number of issues with regards to a number of sightings as sort of portals in around that area too. Um, but also um, on the banks of Loch Ness sort of beside Antrim, again, sort of a hidden history is um, there were, uh, whenever they were doing works in Antrim town, um, which is just sort of adjacent to, to the lock, is they, they were digging and it was very deep. It was maybe about um, 20 foot deep. But as they were digging down, then they came across um, the the grave of a of a giant. Some, some, some would call them like a Nephilim, you know, so, um, and, uh, but, 12 foot tall or more you know so uh, but again that's that height that you're talking about there yeah exactly that so i think it's always been in your history it's always mm -hmm. been it was just we just weren't told about it it was just you know it was something of old it was myth it was law um but these all of these all of these beings exist and as we tune into them then they become more alive but so do we so it, like it kind of sort of stretches your abilities so for me and me automatic rise it's not really something i share it's just something that happens between me and him and and i get messages and sometimes i share them and sometimes i don't it's just it was just something that i've always kind of done and the, the message is always about how we used to walk hand in hand with them 
we always walked hand and we understood the earth we understood the rhythm we understood all of that and then for some reason we changed we started to we fight nature humans on a daily basis you know and if you look through their eyes they see like a tropical beautiful paradise that's just been weed killered down to nothing and they see us humans doing that so their message for us is like wake up you know like you need to you're destroying yourselves we've taken away everything that makes us strong about being people you know we used to walk outside in bare feet and ground ourselves on the land we trusted our gut to make decisions we didn't need a computer to tell us what to do we knew what to do we knew every food in every hedgerow every medicine that was out there that nature could give us if we had that knowledge now not one of us would have to pay for a medicine and not one of us would have to go to a supermarket and we had those skills and they've gone. They've been taken away from us. So by tuning back into the fair, tuning back into Bigfoot, whatever name you want to give them, you tune back into them and your spirit as a, as a human starts to, to grow. You start to get strong again. Well, the elite, the powerful don't want that, Rosa. A very small population of man rule this, this planet. And if we were strong enough to be able to stand up to them, they would be very, very different because the first thing I did was ban all mining, all logging, all of it would stop and be like, you need to put the woodlands back to what they were. They're very important. They are the lungs of us humans. And we kind of lost that. And I feel like I'm here today to kind of say to people, just put your thoughts out there because they were there in history. Your ancestors were able to tap into them and they were able to communicate with them and we were able to live as one with no you know no wars between us um and that could happen again because there's a big change coming and i don't know what what subjects people are into but they will have felt it there's a change coming and we're not ready for it as humans we're going to lose and it, we're on a tipping point as it stands at the moment because we've stopped tapping into our ancient souls your ancestors, the blood that's within you, you're not that the 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 best human you could be. You're not fulfilling your potential. And you should do that. I, I, if I had my way again, I was 30, I'd just go and live in the woodlands. I'd never have a mortgage. I'd never have a car. I'd never have a job. I'd just it, go and use the knowledge I have now, just go and live in a shed in the woods because I'd been, I would would have been much happier as a person. Because we, human beings are not made for this lifestyle. We're just not. We are sentient beings. We are supposed to tap in to every element around us. And like the trees, we're supposed to be able to tap into them. I had a conversation once in, in Sasquatch, in, in Dream Speak, and I was told, I asked him, what are you? And he said, I'm the oaks. I am the grass. I am the drain. I am the same as you. We are nature. And I understood that to mean that everything we do affects the people around us so if we can tap in then they can you give them the ability you give them the choice to say why don't you look into your history why don't you find out what paranormal things have happened in your area and go out there and see if you can tap into it or you know anything that you feel like doing just do it run with it you know what what have you got to lose it costs absolutely nothing to go for a walk in a woodland but eventually and i mean this really seriously what you were speaking about then about that lock I'm in a very strange position where I'm sat back looking back 40 years at sighting reports and I am noticing consistently in areas where there are supposed underground bases, people are seeing the strangest of things and then that land is being posted as private or as SSI, meaning special scientific interest, which means us humans cannot walk on it. Why? What do they know that we don't know? What's within there? I spoke to a gentleman yesterday and I haven't told anybody else this because I only interviewed him last night at seven o'clock. And he said to me that his father worked for the uh, Irish government and between Dublin and basically underneath the Isle of Man, right? Underneath the Isle of Man, there is this huge dub. And in the 1970s, his father was a photographer and he was really well in his, you know, he was quite up there. He knew all the latest gadgets and the best ways to get photographs and all of that. They were paid to go on holiday to um, one area. And while they were there, they were take, his father was taken down into a military base. He said he was in the lift for about two and a half miles. It went that far below, right? 
And at the bottom of it, there were all these tunnels that stretched out. And as he followed one of them, he was taken down by armed guard. There was a beast within a cage in there. And he said it must have been at least 60 feet tall. And it looked like a combination of a man, an ape and a dog. And it was curled up in the corner, um, clearly been trapped for a very long time. And he said his father came back up and he was completely white when he came back up. And he said, Debbie, he never spoke about that day, only once when I was an adult. And that's when he told me. And he said he was bound by the, you know, the uh, secrets act. I'm not really sure how you how you word that. But he was said that, you know, obviously, if he ever shared what he saw down there, then he would probably disappear, you know. How many of the areas are like that? Just in England or Ireland, Scotland or Wales. I've worked on lots of places like that. It's terrifying. It is. You know, we, we've been having sort of these conversations um, and it's funny, there was and uh, there just happened to be a number of um, forest fires. I think it was, was it February or March yeah. in around all of these special areas of scientific interest there uh, um, not last year but the year before during the lockdowns you know so yeah. and uh, because which is you know but I mean that sort of that 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 pretty much follows that line that you were sort of just discussing there you know sort of a, a sort of an interesting areas you know that there's a lot that we're, we're kind of being held back from sort of seeing and as you say just tap into being your natural self and sort of yeah. literally stand step away step away from from the you know from the tv screen and um and just getting on with living your own life i mean in uh, scandinavian countries but they mm. have um an association with moss and the and and the fairy so i mean that seems to be sort of and also another theme you know is is that there's something about moss whether it's just a comfortable kind of a thing to be walking on sort of um or or maybe there, there's something um sentient or something that's sort of maybe maybe attractive to the likes of sort of fairy or she or whatever what are have you got any sort of um thoughts about moss and and these sort of liminal sort of species I, the, the only way I've looked into it, and it's very strange how I ended up there, there was a gentleman in um, Australia, and he discovered, quite by accident, he had no signal. He was out there in the middle of nowhere, and he had no signal whatsoever on his phone, and he was desperate. And for some strange reason, he put his phone on this pile of sticks in this woodland, and his phone signal just kicked in in the middle of nowhere. Completely impossible. So he asked, when he got back to civilization, he asked his friend in Colorado to do the same. And his friend mocked it up in the garden, put the iPhone on top of it, and it increased the signal. And I just watched that video by accident one day, flicking through YouTube. So I said to my husband, when people make Bigfoot reports, a lot of the times they'll go into the woodlands and they'll see like these teepee structures of, of wood. And a lot of people think that, they, that they're like hideouts and it's completely, that's completely impossible because it's in the middle of a wood where a, a human walks. Any creature worth his salt's not going to be there. But I thought they've got to be there for a reason. So just after seeing that video, I thought, right, I'll, I'll do that test, what that man did. So I put my phone on top and my, my signal went right up to 5G. And I, I said to my husband, right, you do it. And he did. So my friend had a, an Android and it was the opposite for her. So like it dropped quite far for her kind of thing. So one day I'm out on an investigation and I've got an internet meth meter with me. And I thought, right, I'm going to, if I see anything in the woods that resembles that, I'm going to try it. And I realised that when I put my EMF meter near the moss, it really spiked as if there was like an electricity there. So I went over to an old wall and the moss was giving off a signal. There was no electrics within that wall. I'm in the middle of a woodland in the moor and the moor, top of Winter Hill in northeast of England, for anyone who knows it. There's nothing out there electric, but that moss was giving off an electrical signal and it was a high electrical signal. So that tells me there's through it wow Maybe happy <laughs> i wasn't expecting that as a response i'll tell you and, wow yeah and it was just complete i made my husband phone it i was like film this now because nobody's going to believe me i saw we had other people with us and they did the same thing that wall every time we hit that moss that wall lit up basically and the reason i went there was there was a couple driving down the road one night and a big thick black dog ran out from the side of the woods in front of their car. They hit it. 
They pulled to a screech. There was no dog there, nothing wrong with the car, and the dog had just disappeared. And that's why I went there that day. I was going there to investigate that report, and I like to go in blind. So I was in the car. We had investigators in the car in front of us, and I'm in the car at the back with my husband. And we're driving down the road, and I said to him, we've gone past it. And he was like, no, no, they're still going. I said, don't care, we've gone past it. Turn the car around, we've gone past it. It was like crossing a ley line. The, the same whooshy kind of makes you feel drunk feeling. So I knew I was on the right line. So that that energy there of the ley is somehow connected to that moss within that woodland because that's where I was getting the signal from. And it was just unbelievable. There's not a plant on this earth that can give out an electrical signal, but moss can. <laughs> You know, that's that, one of the that's that's incredible, Deborah. I tell you, I was not expecting that as a response. <laughs> I'd sort of thought that maybe there was some sort of a, just a, a vibe around it, but I wasn't realizing that it was sort of there was something electrical, you know. So, um, the, well, you're, right. you're yeah. absolutely right, there is some kind of vibe around it. Energy is energy, no matter how we feel it mm -hmm. or interpret it, it's energy. So, for you, it feels like a vibe. Trust your instinct, don't question it, don't mm -hmm. say. It might be this, but if that's what you think it is, and that's what it is, I did it in a scientific way with the meter. You did it with your intuition. Yeah, it's different for each of us, but we'll get the same answer in the end. That's incredible. Look, Deborah, <laughs> thank you so much for spending so much time with us this evening. Um, Deborah, do you know I think um once this goes out, and you know the, there's some listeners here from Ireland, um. I'd say there'll be a lot of people that'll want to get in contact to put their their little sort of sightings on your map, you know. So, so what what is the best place to contact you to to get those sightings logged? Well, I've made it really easy for people. If you put in Deborah Hatswell YouTube, you'll find me. Deborah Hatswell Facebook, mm -hmm. and then my email address is just debbiehatswell at gmail dot com, and I'll share that with you for you. She could maybe put it in the description of the show. Um, mm -hmm. but honestly, look for me or find Miles or find Nell message me. Um, and he, it might take me a couple of days to get back to you because I'm always really, really busy, but I will get back to you every time I get a, an email. I always get back to them, but I'll, I'll send some links across to you that will make it easy for you. That's wonderful. Look, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. That's been, that's incredible. I, because I just, once I saw, um, once, once it was sort of said, you know, um, to, to look at this because, and it just, it, it just, it just struck me as being amazing, you know, sort of, it was just the, the number of sightings of various liminal creatures in such such close proximity this brings it to the fore that um that that literally the veil is thin you know and in certain certain places it just seems to be a bit thinner than others but it seems to be um unsurprisingly it seems to be those particular areas are ancient woodlands ancient woodlands covered in moss you know sort of um beside um deep blocks and and running water you know sort and where the water is of good quality as well you know sort of these are sort of maybe just yeah. areas that are just away from the from the public but there they would be quality kinds of areas you know sort yeah. of and i think that's what we need is to be making sure that we sort of help develop more of those kind of areas because it's good for them it's good for us too you know so um it's uh, you know it's 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 a win-win situation yeah just take a carrier bag into the woods next time you go for a walk and any human rubbish you see put it in the bag and take it home you'll be rewarded and you'll be rewarded for doing that and i've done that my entire life and if you feel like picking a stone up or you find a feather or a certain stick and you want to put it in your pocket do it don't think okay. oh silly do it because it's there for you it's a message for you some people will see white feathers there are lots of serendipities that you will start to notice as you keep going back into nature you know and it that you'll that'll take you on a journey that for me has been probably the best journey of anyone i can think of i've had an incredible life and it's just just chill with nature and it, my grandmother told me that thousands and thousands of ancestors fell in love so that i could be here right this day at this time and i've never forgotten that and she said to me, always walk like they're at your side, Deb, because they are. So if you can think like those ancestors back then, how they would have looked at an area and, and interacted with it, just do that. Just just find your old soul, your old, old soul. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
That's beautiful. That's really beautiful, Deborah. Look, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to to talk to us this evening. But I would say your your phone will be hopping, you know, so because there's so many people. And I think a lot of people want other people to know about sort of where they'd had sightings, especially whenever they were significant or that sort of it happened whenever they were children, you know, that they just basically they want that kind of acknowledgement, you know, sort of. And they know whenever they put it out there that somebody else is going to come forward and said, I saw that too, you know, you know, so yeah. and uh, it helps True. everybody. It really it, helps everybody. Mm -hmm. Because somebody else will listen to it when I put it out there and it will make them come forward with something. I think mm -hmm. what speak your own truth, I think you fit yourself a little bit better. You say, actually, that did happen. I know that happened and I've shared it. And, you know, well, I've never met anyone yet that we have not ended up as a friend with through doing what I do. So I'm sure... Wow. Every is out there that needs to speak to me, they will. And if you want me to come back on, Rosie, just let me know and I will. The Sasquatch, was it, was it, I'd heard that they lived to hundreds of years of age as well. Is that correct, Debra? Ah, I think they're ancient. I think their years are very different to ours. I think human years, uh, time's just a human concept, isn't it? That's, but that's a whole show. <laughs> okay. okay, look, thank you very much. Thank you, Debra.